All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and happy United Nations Day. Uh, today is UN Day, which marks the anniversary of the entry into force in 1945 of the UN Charter. In his message, the Secretary General said that every day the women and men of the United Nations work to give practical meaning to the Charter. Despite the odds and the obstacles, we never give up, he said, and called on UN staff to reaffirm their commitment to eradicate poverty, reduce inequality, protect human rights, and work for peace in all parts of the world. And this evening at 7 p.m., the UN Day concert will take place in the General Assembly Hall and will feature Sarod Virtuoso Ustad Amjad Ali Khan, who will be accompanied by his sons Aman Ali Bangash and Ayan Ali Bangash and the Refugee Orchestra Project. The theme of this year's concert is Traditions of Peace and Nonviolence and it is sponsored by the Permanent Mission of India. In response to questions on the Secretary General's travel to Washington, D.C. yesterday, I can say the following. The Secretary General met with U.S. Secretary of State Michael Pompeo on Tuesday, and they continued their discussions on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the path towards denuclearization, the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Yemen, and Syria. Speaking of Syria, the Special Envoy for Syria, Stefan de Mistura, visited Damascus today and met Walid al-Mawalam, the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister. They had a frank and intense exchange of views in a cordial atmosphere. The meeting took place following that between the Secretary General and Deputy Prime Minister Mualem in New York on the 28th of September, and against the backdrop of continuing consultations of the Special Envoy on the launch of a constitutional committee giving effect to the Sochi final statement. The Special Envoy will report to the Secretary General. He also looks forward to briefing the Security Council. He will be engaging in intensive further consultations in the period ahead as he continues the task of verifying the possibilities for convening a credible and balanced UN-facilitated Syrian-owned and Syrian-led constitutional committee. In this context, he will continue to fully discharge his mandate for the remainder of his tenure. The Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mark Lowcock, briefed the Security Council yesterday afternoon and told the members that there is now a clear and present danger of an imminent and great big famine engulfing Yemen much bigger than anything any professional in this field has seen during their working lives. He warned that an additional 3.5 million people are likely to, to become severely food insecure in the months ahead, added to the 8 million Yemenis that are already being reached each month through the UN-coordinated response effort. Meanwhile, he said, the immune systems of millions of people on survival support for years on end are now collapsing, making them, especially children and the elderly, more likely to succumb to malnutrition, cholera, and other diseases. He called on all stakeholders to do everything possible to avert catastrophe. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us that recent insecurity in several areas in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo has forced tens of thousands of people to flee for safety and caused many humanitarian organizations to suspend or limit their activities. In Beni, North Kivu, the epicenter of the new Ebola outbreak, Following the most recent attack on the 20th of October, when at least 12 civilians were killed, all humanitarian activities were suspended, including the Ebola Treatment Center, which had no medical staff in place for about three hours. Activities had already been suspended before in September for several days due to direct threats against humanitarian actors. There have also been serious concerns about infiltrations by armed groups in the Ruzizi Plain and the regions along the shores of Lake Tanganyika, also in eastern DRC, including armed confrontations, which led to the suspension of humanitarian operations on the 20th of October in the areas between Camagnola and Uvira. Insecurity and displacement are putting serious pressure on an already stretched humanitarian response in the country, where the number of people in need of humanitarian protection and assistance has nearly doubled over the last year to an estimated 13.1 million people, one out of every seven Congolese. This morning, the Security Council was briefed by the President of the International Court of Justice, Abdul Kawi Ahmed Yusuf. In the afternoon, the Council is scheduled to have a meeting on Myanmar. The UN World Data Forum wrapped up today in Dubai with the launch of a Dubai Declaration to increase financing for better data and statistics for sustainable development. The declaration calls for the establishment of an innovative funding mechanism that will aim to mobilize both domestic and international funds and to activate partnerships to strengthen national data and statistical systems. It was announced that Switzerland will host the next UN World Data Forum in Bern 
in October 2020. More information is available online. And today is World Development Information Day, which seeks to draw attention to development problems and the need to strengthen international cooperation to solve them. Today, we thank Cameroon, which has paid its regular budget dues in full. The total on the honor roll is now 146. And you will hear after I'm done from Monica Grayley, the spokeswoman for the President of the General Assembly. Then today at 1.15 p.m. in the press briefing room, there will be a press briefing by Michael Link, special rapporteur on the human rights situation in the Palestinian territories. Also today at 1.45 p.m., there will be a press briefing by Jabed Rahman, special rapporteur on the human rights situation in Iran. Then tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., there will be a press briefing by Baskut Tunchak, Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Implications of Hazardous Waste. At 1.15 p.m. tomorrow, there will be a press briefing by Victor Madrigal Borlos, independent expert on protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And at 1.45 tomorrow, there will be a press briefing by Agnes Kayamard, Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Executions. And that is it for me. Are there any questions before we go to Monica? Yes, Joe. Yes, uh, you referred to the uh, Security Council briefing this morning by the President of the International Court of Justice. Uh, at the last minute, uh, it seems a decision was made, or at least it was announced to us, that it was closed. Um, number one, I'm wondering if you have any knowledge of why that uh, was the case, because I believe it was an annual briefing. And secondly, is there any summary? I'm talking now about the regular annual briefing, not what they might have discussed on specific cases more sensitively. Is there any uh, a summary of the briefing that uh, we can obtain? Uh, we cannot uh, provide a summary of his uh, briefing con because the meeting was closed. Uh, it was closed uh, as a result of a decision by the members of the Security Council on the agenda for the day. Uh, yes, Masood. Thank you, Farhan. I w want to know about the human rights of uh, children, especially, particularly, uh, two uh, places, especially in in Israel, incarceration of children, in jail, and there is no updates being issued by the Israeli government again and again. That's one, and that similar situation seems to be now existing on incarceration of children in China. Can you please comment on these two things? Uh, well, regarding uh, uh, the question of uh, the incarceration of uh, Palestinian children uh, uh, in Israeli detention, uh, as, as you know, we've had periodic updates uh, uh, using information from uh, the Israeli authorities and human rights groups. Uh, and so the number uh, tends to fluctuate ar around 200 to 300 uh, at, any given, uh, at any given time. And, and we've expressed uh, our... Concerns that uh, all of those uh, detained uh, be uh, uh, be uh, tried, uh, 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 near charge and tried and or or otherwise uh, let go. Um, regarding China, I don't have any uh, figures uh, to give you about uh, about the situation from the authorities there. So there are reports about the hundreds of uh, schools being open in for the Chinese Muslim. Is there any truth to these uh, reports? Uh, I would uh, I'd refer you to uh, the work of um, the uh, the human rights rapporteurs uh, who have who have uh, periodically come out with information about the situation of of uh, the Uyghurs. Yes, James. Uh, yes, Farhan. Um, about the Secretary General's visit to Washington D.C., uh, you gave us a brief readout of his meeting with Secretary Pompeo, which mm -hmm. was about 30 minutes of the day. Mm -hmm. um, you told us that there were other meetings, the Appropriations Committee you mentioned yesterday. Can you give us a full list of who he met? Did he meet anyone from uh, the White House? And then I have a question on substance after that. Uh, I, I do believe he met with uh, some uh, individual representatives, but, uh, but uh, I was not able to get... Uh the names from my colleagues uh, in Washington on that. This is the uh, alert that goes off. Suspicious package. Some, somewhere else, presumably, right? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, anyone else have their phones on? You're going to be getting alerts. Uh, so, um, 
uh, and uh, and I believe uh, he had um, a, a, a dinner event with the foundation. But aside from that, uh, he he didn't have uh, any uh, of, uh, meetings with the U.S. officials uh, uh, with White House officials beyond the Secretary of State. But he did meet. Um, people from Congress, senators and congressmen. Uh, I believe he met a few uh, individual okay. members. Okay. In of terms of those meetings, then at the State Department and at Congress, is the Secretary General any clearer? Given this administration has already pulled out of key international agreements and stopped funding of various parts of the UN, whether there are any other parts of the UN that are currently at risk. We have the Universal Postal Union just a matter of days ago. Is that, was he told if there were any other areas that are under consideration by this administration for cuts? And in terms of um, meeting members of the Appropriations Committee, uh, was he given any idea whether there's any further threat to the UN budget and any idea of the US and its payment of arrears, particularly on peacekeeping? Uh, well, f uh, first of all, the, the, although we tend, to, for our honor roll purposes, to flag full contributions. Uh, although we haven't had a full contribution from the United States, in recent weeks uh, we have had significant amounts of money that the U.S. has contributed uh, to, uh, to regular budget and peacekeeping operations. So, so we do get money from the United States government, and uh, I would like to express our appreciation for that. Uh, I, I'm not aware uh, of any particular uh, problems uh, regarding uh, U.S. funding. Uh, obviously, when we get those announcements, we let you know about that, but there's nothing to say on this at this stage. I have one more D.C. question, yeah. if it's possible, which is, in addition to the Secretary General, Martin Griffiths was also in D.C. meeting the Deputy Secretary of State. Have you any update from that meeting and any update on how Mr. Griffiths's overall mission is going and how likely he thinks it is to be able to reconvene talks, maybe in Geneva, or there is also talk of Vienna or Kuwait now. Uh, he is proceeding with efforts to try to get the parties together for talks. Uh, I don't have an announcement on when the next round of talks would be, but uh, yes, he did uh, brief uh, officials, including uh, recently Secretary of State Pompeo, uh, about the progress he's making, and he continues uh, to be hopeful that, that we're moving ahead and can move uh, to a round of negotiations. A yes. timeline on that? What? A timeline on that? Uh, not, not at this stage, no. Yes. Thank you, Farhan. A uh, couple of questions. Number one, does the Secretary General has anything to add when it comes uh, to the investigation on Mr. Khashoggi's death? Does he have, does he want to appeal to somebody to ask for something? to speed up the investigation? And does he think that this was a cover-up, as President Trump said, from Saudis? Uh, regarding uh, the, the case, uh, you'll have seen what the Secretary General has said uh, about the death of Jamal Khashoggi. We issued a statement last Friday. He called, he, he called, uh, he called uh, for a prompt, uh, thorough, and transparent investigation, and we continue uh, to hold to that. Uh, we wouldn't characterize uh, any of the recent information beyond uh, noting that all of the accounts in recent days point again to the need for this to be fully investigated. But uh, yesterday we did have a major development with President Erdogan uh, asking for Saudis to, proposing actually for Saudis to deliver those who were arrested and to be charged and uh, to be put on trial in, in Istanbul. What does the Secretary General think on delivering the justice on, on that? Because this is obviously very important. Well, obviously, we, we want uh, justice to be done and for people to be held accountable. And in, the, in that regard, the statement that we issued uh, on Friday and the sentiments in those are unchanged. Does, yes. this, does the Secretary General, just one more, please. Does the Secretary General mean, uh, thinks that uh, the fair justice process would be delivered for those individuals in Riyadh or elsewhere in Saudi We will have to see uh, what, uh, what is on offer. Yes. A question, two questions regarding the Cyprus issue. In his report, the Secretary General says nothing about Turkey. The question is simple. According to the Secretary General and the United Nations, Turkey did not invade and occupy 
illegally part of Cyprus land? Uh, as you know, we have had many reports uh, on, uh, on Cyprus uh, over the years, as, uh, from the 1970s through to now. And so I would just refer you to, to all of the reports, which are self-explanatory and, uh, and which describe the situation. Okay, let's take the, the recent one. In his conclusions, the Secretary General says that the solution to the Cyprus issue is up to the Cypriots to decide. How can the Cypriots decide as long as the Turkish troops are on the Cyprus land? Uh, without getting into the history of the conflict, we have always held firmly to the position that any solution is up to the Cypriot communities, and we continue to, to push for that, as, as we have done uh, consistently for the past decades. May, may, I, may I ask another question? Regarding sure, everyone is asking three questions in a row anyway. Why not you? <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, the question is regarding the 2038 journalist uh, the huge majority in Cyprus, who rejected the clausery as a way against freedom of speech. In his report, the Secretary General seems to agree with OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, and the clausery by using the words to encourage, to promote, and to help. Um, at the same time, the Secretary General says nothing about Turkish threats and there are so-called accusations and swing against a Turkish Cypriot editor, Senel Levent, who did, not, did nothing but being a Cypriot who speaks freely. How would you respond to that? What, what is I that would a fair treatment? What, what I would respond is uh, that uh, the language uh, of the Secretary General's reports on Cyprus are self-explanatory and, uh, and are independent and separate apart uh, from the views of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is uh, an independent, uh, which but works wording it the same independently view. of us. No, uh, their their views are theirs, and we don't speak for their views. Uh, Michelle, thanks, Farhan. Um, stop me if someone has already asked this because I was running down here and missed a couple of questions. Um, Secretary Pompeo's readout of his meeting with the SG mentioned that. Um, he spoke to the SG about this US meeting last week, which was disrupted by the Cubans and Bolivians. Um, they were talking about monetary val uh, putting monetary value on damage done. You said that you weren't aware of any cost, of any damage that would cost anything. Is there any update to that? Do we know if there was... Uh, at this stage, no. Uh, basically, uh, we did receive a letter on this from the U mission uh, and are considering that letter. Uh, at this point, we're, we're simply at the stage of considering a response. But, but there's no... I mean, they're, they're accusing the Cubans and the Bolivians of causing damage that is going to cost the UN to fix. Does the, is the UN aware of that damage and how much do you think it would cost to fix? Um, like I said, uh, at this point, we're at simply at the stage of reviewing the letter and considering our response to it. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Lavo the New York, Suman Ali. I wanted to know what you can tell us about the Secretary General's discussion with Mr. Pompeo regarding Saudi Arabia and Khashoggi. Uh, well, uh, I've, I mentioned uh, uh, a brief readout of that meeting at the start of, uh, of this particular briefing, and I don't have anything really to add to it. Uh, yes, Mr. Badi. Thank you, Farhan. At the beginning, you mentioned that this is uh, United Nations Day. What does the Secretary General think of the state of the staff of the organization? Well, uh, on, on today, uh, certainly he r renews his appreciation for the work that uh, UN staff uh, do. And I'd refer you uh, to uh, the, the remarks and, and messages that he puts out for this day. But, uh, but it is a day in which uh, he once again uh, uh, expresses appreciation for all of the work uh, done throughout the UN system. Uh, yes, Joe. Yeah, actually, these are two follow-ups on two different matters. On the Kosoji matter, has the Secretary General considered um, reaching out directly to the king and or prince uh, uh, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, as well as uh, President Erdogan, using his moral authority uh, to um, accelerate uh, what he 
characterizes an independent, transparent, and thorough investigation. Is there any plan to have direct communication between the Secretary General and those leaders? Uh, well, if he, if he does have any direct communications with them, I'll, let, I'll certainly let you know at that point. Okay. Well, well, all right. uh, yeah. uh, on Cyprus, um, the Secretary General of the UN institutionally has spoken out against uh, settlements um, in the West Bank uh, as being illegal. So in Cyprus, there are settlements by Turks who, uh, who have gone over to Cyprus, settled there, established settlements under the protection of the Turkish army. Would the Secretary General regard those settlements as l illegal as has been characterized about the Israeli settlements? Well, uh, first of all, uh, re regarding questions of international law and, and settlements, I'd refer you to the relevant UN resolutions, including Security Council resolutions in each of the cases. That is to say, in the Palestinian matter and the Cyprus matter, and the, the language uh, uh, in each uh, case uh, is what you should refer to in that. And, uh, and as you will have seen, uh, and as I informed Nikos uh, just seconds ago, uh, we have a range of Secretary General's reports, and I can refer you to that, th that language there. Carla? about the fact that the United States um, has forbidden all humanitarian aid to North Korea. This was reported in the New York Times last week. Uh, we are continuing our, um, our efforts to ensure that the Democratic People's Republic of Korea uh, has uh, sufficient humanitarian aid. Uh, in recent weeks, uh, we had been pointing to the fact that only about 11% of the funding needs that we've uh, specified for humanitarian uh, assistance to the DPRK has been uh, has been provided. I believe that number has gone up recently to about 14 or so percent with uh, recent contributions, including from the Central Emergency Response Fund. But uh, but there still is a need for all member states to uh, uh, to provide the necessary funding for this effort. If there's only 11% funding aid available, who would provide for the other 89%? Well, well, well this, these are voluntary funds, so we need states, all states, uh, to the extent that they can, to, to provide. Uh, yes, in the back. You had your hand up. Pozzi, la voce di New York, Italian media. Uh, a second migrant caravan is forming at the Honduras border and is expected to follow the largest one. Uh, is the Secretary General concerned about uh, all the situation and how President Trump is managing this issue? Uh, we, we've talked in recent days about uh, the situation on the ground. Uh, regarding the, the caravan that had already been on the move, uh, we have uh, our uh, colleagues in uh, Mexico, including uh, the various UN agencies, uh, most particularly the UN Refugee Agency and the International Organization for Migration, who are involved in dealing with the local authorities to try uh, to provide assistance uh, to their efforts in dealing with the approximately 7,000 or so people who uh, have been on the move there. And we'd uh, do that for any other people who are on the move. Yes, Masood. Uh, two follow-ups, uh, Farhan. Um, one is about this uh, ongoing uh, Khashoggi uh, saga, his killing at the hands of the Saudi agents. Is there at any point in time, I mean, this question has been asked of you again and again, at any point in time, can the Secretary General, will he appoint a, a sort of an inquiry commission at all? I know you have answered this question, is that member states have to ask for it. When does he expect the member state, how does he expect the member state to ask for it? Uh, I don't have anything really to add to what I've been saying about this. Uh, obviously, if if requests come in, we'll consider them once, you know, if and when we receive those. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, and another follow-up that I wanted to ask you was about the uh, in Yemen situation in Yemen. I mean, has there been any uh, movement on side of some Saudis to give further aid or to stop bombing the? Yemeni children? Uh, well, uh, we, we've tried to make sure that the hostilities are, are lessened on the ground, but uh, I would just refer you to uh, Mark Lokok's uh, very sober 
uh, and, uh, and very alarming briefing to the Security Council from, for, from yesterday uh, for the information uh, because the amount of humanitarian need on the ground has grown uh, uh, very large in, uh, in recent weeks. Yes. Yes, Farhan. Um, I have a new question on, what, on the meetings in Damascus, but can I just ask a follow-up to Michelle's question about the Bolivia-Cuba <laughs> protest at the U.S. meeting? Because I'm not aware. Maybe you can help us. What's, what are the, the, the regulations, the procedures? Are they secretariat procedures? Are they General Assembly procedures for the conduct of meetings and use of rooms? O under what procedure could there be disciplinary action taken? Uh, I think uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves in terms of uh, describing what potential action might be taken. Uh, is, well, is it a secretariat we're, we're, or, or we're GA matter? We're considering a response, and then we'll share that response. I'll, I'll let you know once that's happened. Okay. On Damascus, you talked about frank and intense meeting uh, between the special envoy and the deputy prime minister of Syria. You haven't really told us what the outcome was. Clearly, he went there to solve a very specific problem, which was the Constitutional Committee and that civil society element. Was there any progress, any breakthrough on that issue? And a part of that question I want to ask as well, because I've never heard the answer to this. Diplomats tell me that the special envoy could just name that civil society group he doesn't have to get Syrian buy-in. Why doesn't he just name those members? Uh, well, regarding that, uh, Mr. De Mistura, in his own remarks to reporters uh, following today's meeting, made clear that uh, at this stage, uh, the results of that meeting, he will share that with the Secretary General and the Security Council. So we uh, uh, will wait uh, to hear from him on, uh, on that once he gives those briefings. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, Farhan, just in answer of your last question, when I asked you about the judicial process in Saudi Arabia, you said you have to see what is the offer. So what does it mean, what is the offer? Uh, what, what is on offer is what I said. What is on uh, offer? And also... We'll, uh, the, the point I'm making is we'll, we'll have to see what is being proposed. Proposed from whom? From, uh, from the various parties who are dealing with this issue. And also, we are mentioning that there is a moral authority of the Secretary General in the case of Mr. Khashoggi. Uh, but how do you see, obviously, I think it's a time to ask the question, how do you see the role of the Secretary General in this investigation? Uh, like I said, the Secretary General has expressed his views on this in the statement that we, uh, we put out uh, recently, and we're continuing to follow up. We'll have to see uh, what happens down the line. Uh, obviously, the UN, in, in all matters, uh, off, offers to be helpful to, uh, to member states as needed. But let's see what that entails in but this case. the personal role of the Secretary General. What is the personal role of the Secretary, of the Secretary General? I think it is still an early stage to talk about what precisely the role is. I, I've said in, gener in more general terms what that, that normally constitutes, but how it plays out in this case, we'll have to see. Can I just ask a follow-up directly uh, to no, that? No, hold on. He's first. Yes. Yes, you. Thank you, Farhan. Does the Secretary General consider that the killing of journalists all over the world touches on questions of peace and security? It, he believes that this is a, a major problem and a major human rights issue that all the countries of the world need to take seriously. Uh, the importance of having a free media means that journalists around the world need to feel safe, and that clearly is not is what is happening right now. Yes. All right. Uh, and actually, this follow-up is to both of these questions because the next logical question would be, I believe if I'm citing the correct article in the charter, uh, I think it's Article uh, or Chapter 99 or Article 99, um, that the Secretary General has the authority uh, to make recommendations to the Security Council, be proactive. And so if he would deem the killing of journalists, such as in this most recent incident involving Mr. Kasaji, uh, a threat, potential threat to peace and security, would he be uh, inclined to consider being proactive and making a recommendation to the Security Council that it be, this matter be placed on its agenda and action be taken accordingly. At this stage, we're looking at how the developments on the ground unfold and what is to be requested of us, and we will respond 
uh, depending upon how that how that develops. Yes. Uh, thank you. I don't know what the general's view is on the matter of press being oppressed, especially in states like Saudi Arabia, Myanmar, and why aren't we taking tougher stands as the UN, and why isn't your office taking a tougher stance on this issue? Because as I see that several of my colleagues have raised this concern, and uh, we just keep getting these diplomatic answers and I have to say that honestly, I am not satisfied with these responses. Well, I note your dissatisfaction, but at the same time, you, uh, you need to be aware of the fact that we do repeatedly talk, both in public and in private, about the rights of journalists. The Secretary General has himself directly intervened in efforts uh, to uh, make sure that uh, reporters, including many of uh, the colleagues of people I see in this room, are... are uh, freed uh, uh, from uh, detention or otherwise uh, uh, freed from different forms of official harassment. Uh, and he continues to speak out against the mistreatment of journalists, most, most recently in the case of, of Mr. Khashoggi, but, uh, but we do this uh, constantly. And we do this also through the other key officials of the system, including the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and the head of the UN Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. What's needed is not necessarily more words from the United Nations, but more actions from governments to make sure that reporters' rights are respected everywhere in the world. And we are pressing governments to do just that. Yes. Uh, just to follow up on that, as you know, there have been calls from various bodies for a UN special representative to deal with these issues, journalist st safety and press freedom. Where are we on that? What is the Secretary General's thinking on that? Well, uh, no one has been named to that, uh, basically because there are, as I've pointed out, two organizations, the High Commission for Human Rights and UNESCO, that deal precisely with these matters. And we don't want to have uh, too much of a duplication of effort. Uh, but, uh, but of course, we'll always try to consider whatever steps can be taken to uh, ensure greater security for journalists. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, the UN is holding the uh, World Data Forum in Dubai. Does anybody from the UN has going to give the, um, a sign that it's not okay what's happened with Khashoggi and it's not okay? Uh, or does anybody uh, thought uh, we are not going in Dubai because um, we have to give a sign like uh, a lot of other international organization there uh, decided not to go to Dubai as long the Khashoggi uh, case is not clear. I don't mean to correct you or anything, but Dubai is not part of Saudi Arabia. It's, it's, it's a separate country entirely. It's part of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, wrong, but uh, the, still my question is, is uh, anybody there going to give a sign uh, that uh, what's uh, happened? Okay. Uh, I'm aware from uh, colleagues who went to the World Data Forum that, uh, that some of these issues were, in fact, discussed there. Uh, yes. Yeah, use the microphone, please. Could you please... I don't think it's working. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's better. All right. Could you please confirm Resolution 186, which says about uh, calls upon all states to respect the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of Cyprus, calls all parties to cease fire, demands an immediate end to the foreign military intervention in the Republic of Cyprus that is in contravention of point one above, and requests the withdrawal of military personnel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is Resolution 186. Could you please? Uh, yes, I can confirm that that's part of the text of Resolution 186. Uh, there's nothing to add to that. There have been many resolutions on Cyprus and many reports, and we stand by those. And with that, please come on up. What? One more. <laughs> one more. Okay. Here is one. 
after everything what has been said and what you had offered as answers, so do you think that UN is really not doing enough on uh, Mr. Khashoggi's investigation and could and can and should do more on that? Very moral question. It's, that's really a question of opinion, and you're entitled to your opinions about this. What I'm telling you is that this is a, a, a situation that is still developing. Uh, it's a little bit uh, early to you say. Know it, it, it's a what little is bit. Developing? Please stop yelling over me. Uh, it is. It, it's a situation that's still developing, and it's a little bit early to tell what role, in the end, uh, the UN or other organizations will play. All right, come on up. Thank you very much, Fahan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, happy one day. <laughs>